Jai Radha Mahadava Jai Kundavi Hari Jai Radha Mahadava Jai Ho Kunrubi Hari Gopi Janaba Lampa Jai Girivara Dari Jai Girivara Dari Gopi Janaba Lava Jai Girivada Hari Jai Girivada Hari Yasurananda Deo Rajadanaranda Yasurananda Jai Brajadanananda Tira Panachadi Jai Ho Kunjavi Hari Jai Ho Kunjavi Hari Tira Banachari Jayo Gunjabi Hari Jaya Gunjabi Hari Jai Radha Mahava Jai Kunjavi Hari Jai 
Jayarat Madhavan Jayo Kunjavi Hari Gopi Janaba Daba Jai Ho Girivada Dari Jai Ho Girivada Dari Radhe Gopi Dana Balava Jaya Girivada Dhani Jaya Girivada Dhani Radhe Yasodanandana Jayo Rajajananandana Yasuranandana Jaiho Rajajanarandana Munetira Anachani Jai Ho Bhunja Bhi Hari Jai Ho Bhunja Bhi Hari Chari Jaya Kunjavi Hari Jaya Kunjavi Hari Hare Jaya Radha Amo Jaya Kunja Vihani Jaya Radha Jaya Kunja Bihari Radhe Radhe 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Lord Prem Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Oh Hare Hare Bolo Bye Hey Hey Hare Krishna Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Kirtan. Oh, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Oh, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Oh. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Krishna, Hare. Oh. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram. Ram Ram Hari Hari Ho Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Hari Ram Hari Ram 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 Hari Hare Ho Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Go, Hari Bo, Go. Jai Jai Prabhu Pa, Prabhu Pa, Prabhu Pa, Jai Ho Prabhu Pa.
I know you want to dance, but you have to pick flowers. <laughs> we'll dance tonight. We'll dance all night. <laughs> I'd like to welcome all of you, young and old, new and veterans from obviously different parts of the world. I'm very honored to be here on the eve of the uh, famous Pushpa Festival here in um, Chaupati, Mumbai. I'm a little embarrassed. You can see I'm blushing because um, generally His Holiness Radhana Swami uh, gives this address. But Maharaj came in very late last night and he asked the crow to sit in the place of the swan. So please forgive me, but Maharaj will be speaking this evening. Um, this day is also very special because it's the um, disappearance day of a great uh, saint in our tradition, um, Srila Jayadeva Goswami, who is famous as uh, penning or writing the great Gita Govinda. So we're going to speak about him. Can you find the verse for me? We're going to speak about him today uh, and describe some of his glories just as the Lord has unlimited glories, because his devotees are intimately connected with him, their glories are also unlimited. Just like G Lord Jesus Christ, he said, the Father and I are one. It doesn't necessarily mean that Jesus was one, but he was so intimately united with his Father, it was as if they were one in that transcendental bond. Just like in Vedic culture, when you think of the husband and wife, um, well, when you think of one, you think of the other, and vice versa, because they're so dedicated in a loving uh, relationship. So in the same way, when we think of Krishna, we always remember Krishna's devotees. Uh, it's, it's actually said that you'll never see a painting or you'll never see a, a picture of Krishna alone. The absolute truth means God, the devotee, and the process of loving devotional service. And because there's so much love in the spiritual world, love reigns supreme, therefore there's unlimited devotees engaged in devotional service to the Lord. So as we can speak for hours about our beloved Krishna, his pastimes are unlimited, we can also dis discuss for hours the lives of great devotees who are in service to the Lord either in the spiritual world or here in the material world. For such devotees there's no such thing as the material world because they're so involved in Krishna consciousness that they do the same thing here that they do there. So let us take a few moments and um, read from one of our more important scriptures. It's called the Chaitanya Charitamrita. I think many of our guests are familiar with the Bhagavad Gita, the 700 concise verses of wisdom um, in the Bhagavad Gita. That's like A, B, C, and further on, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Srimad Bhagavatam, X, Y, Z, Chaitanya Charitamrita. This is actually the favorite book of our, our grandfather guru, uh, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. Now bear in mind, uh, we're not going to discuss so much ABCs today, understanding that many of you are spiritual seekers, you're on the spiritual path, you've had association with devotees of the Lord, because Jayadev Goswami is a real Rasik Bhakta. He's a very, very, very deep devotee, and he introduced very, very deep concepts of Krishna consciousness. And we won't go too deep into them because they're quite 
one has to be qualified to hear that deeper subject matter, but we'll touch on them. Why? Because Prabhupada did. There's little splashes of nectar throughout his books where he reveals the higher realms of bhakti or devotional service. So we can take it in little doses. <laughs> Over the years, can take it in little doses and um, build up our bhakti till it becomes amala bhakti. No selfish motivation, but just for the pleasure of Krishna. Just like the gopis of Vrindavan. They're the best representatives of pure devotion, selfless service. One time Prabhupada said, the gopis, they never ask Krishna for anything. They just wanted to serve him. And that is pure bhakti. Even in this world, love means to give more than you take. So that's perfected in the spiritual world. So I'm just giving you a little clue here. There are going to be some deep purports here. And I'm not at all qualified. But uh, we can't ignore them. This great devotee Jayadeva Goswami is the personification. So uh, we're reading from the th uh, 13th chapter of the Adi Leela, uh, text number 42. Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Go Bhaktivindam Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Go Bhaktivindam Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Go Bhakti Vindam So we'd like to ask you not to talk during the class. So I know it's hard to concentrate on the class when you're picking flowers, <laughs> but do uh, try to listen because it's important. Shravanam. Vidyapati Jayadev Chandi Dashera Gita Ashvadena Ramananda Swarupa Sahita. Translation The Lord used to read the books of Vidyapati Jayadev and Chandidash, relishing their songs with his confidential associates like Ramananda Roy and Sarup Dhamardar Goswami. This is the purport of our spiritual master, Sri Prabhupada, by whose mercy we can enter into the understanding of spiritual life. These things are far beyond our ability to, to see or understand, but he makes it quite simple. So he comments on this great person, Jayadev, mentioned in the verse. Jayadev was born during the reign of Maharaj Lakshman Shena of Bengal in the 11th or 12th century of the Saka era. His father was Bojadev and his mother was Vamadevi. For many years, he lived in Nabadweep, then the capital of Bengal. His birthplace was in the Burban district in the village of Kendu Bilva. In the opinion of some authorities, however, he was born in Orissa, and still others say that he was born in South India. He passed the last days of his life in Jagannath Puri. One of his famous books is Gita Govinda, which is full of transcendental mellow feelings of separation from Krishna. The gopis felt separation from Krishna before the rasa dance, as mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And the Gita Govinda ex uh, expresses such feelings. There are many commentaries on the Gita Govinda by many Vaishnavas. Oma Gyan Timadandasya Gerangera Shalakaya Chaksun Miritam Jena Tasmai Sri Gurdavena Maha Sri Chaitanya Manobishtam Shtapitam Jena Bhutale 
Shvayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadanti Swab. Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Dhaita Kadadhar Shri Vasati Gaur. Hare Krishna. Bancha kopa to do pyasya kripa sindhu be bacha paditanam bhavane vashnam. So again today we're observing the disappearance day, not the appearance, but the disappearance day of um, Srila Jayadev Goswami. I learned from one of the old, old disciples of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, the spiritual master of my spiritual master. He told me, he was 103 years old, he told me that in the Gaudiya Math previously, the departure days of great saints were observed with more pomp and circumstance than the appearance days of such saints. I thought that was really interesting. Usually we celebrate somebody's birthday, not their departure. <laughs> this word uh, this phrase, pomp and circumstance, is a term that was actually, you could say, invented by William Shakespeare. It's found in his play, um, Othello. And technically, pomp and circumstance means that uh, a ceremony that's very great and very glorious. So why is the departure of a, a saint celebrated more uh, than his appearance? And this disciple of Bhakti Sananda Saraswati Thakur, he explained very nicely, because at the end of the lives of great souls, we know more about their glories than when they appeared. <laughs> when you come out of the womb, you know, you could be anybody. <laughs> it takes time, if you're a saintly person, for your glories to manifest. If you're a sinful person, it takes a little time, right? You're naughty, but by the time you're 25, you're in jail. <laughs> but if you're a pure devotee coming from the spiritual world, we can expect, um, well, that your full glories will be known by the time you leave. And therefore, we can properly glorify you. Isn't that nice? And the example he gave was that of the lotus. At the nighttime, the lotus is closed because of the darkness. The lotuses, they feed on the sunshine. Actually, some lotuses, they feed on the moonshine. Those are special lotuses. But normally a lotus is closed during the nighttime. But when the sun rises in the morning, the lotus begins to open. And by noon, its glories, you could say, are fully appreciated. <coughs> and so it is with Jayadev Goswami. Um, it's stated in this verse of Chaitanya Charitamrita that there's different opinions where this great saint took uh, birth. But we take it from our uh, grandfather's spiritual master, Bhakti Sananda Saraswati Thakur, that he was born in their Birbhum district in um, a village called Kendu Bilva. And he appeared, interestingly enough, a very deep Rasik, Radha Krishna Bhakta. He appeared about 300 years before Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And as we see in the lives of great personalities, we, see, we sometimes see miraculous events in their childhood, hmm? like a spiritual prodigy. Right? We have, you know, prodigy means that you know your son or daughter picks up, you know, jumps up on the the seat of the piano and starts playing, you know, Beethoven or Tchaikovsky. Like what? <laughs> or, or she picks up a violin at six years old and plays some amazing concerto. This is called prodigy. The scientists have no explanation for this. We know because that person is just carrying on from, from their proclivities in previous life. That's prodigy. So why not spiritual prodigy? Material prodigy, why not? Someone taking up the uh, activities of their previous lifetimes almost immediately. Krishna says this in Gita that um, when a yogi leaves this world um, and he has a little attachment, he has to come back. He can take birth in a family of 
wealthy merchant so he doesn't have to struggle for existence and can continue his practices. Or he may take birth in a family of transcendentalists, ISKCON parents, so to say. And Krishna says that such a birth, verily, he says, the word verily, verily such a birth is rare. So we would expect to see that children born of devoted families, they, they're unusual from the common, from the common people. And such a person was Jayadev. Actually, he, um, his parents passed away when he was very young. And I think he was around seven. So what did he do? Go into an orphanage or live with his aunt or uncle? He went straight to the banks of the Ganges. And he built a little hut, seven-year-old boy. <laughs> and he would sit there. And he, um, somehow or other, no one can explain it, but he, he knew fluent Sanskrit, even as a young boy. It's mystical. And he would sit on the river, and he would compose poems. And he would compose songs um, about Radha and Krishna. And he would sing them. He had a beautiful voice. So the passerbys, they would come, and you know, you'd expect to see an old sada with a long beard, and chanting with a rough voice. Sva, ah, Here's a little boy singing, Jairada Madhava, Kunja Bihati, Gopi Janabalaba, Girivada Dadi. Of course, that's a song penned by Bhaktiv Thakur, but the same principle. He was a young boy, but he was fully Krishna conscious. Just like my spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada. I heard him say one time, there was never a time I knew what was sinful life. And there was never a day in my life I forgot the lotus feet of Radha and Krishna. Siddha Prabhupada Ki. So, this is common amongst saints, amongst Vaishnava saints. And, um, so Jayadev Goswami was like that. At seven years old, he was on the bank of, of the river composing songs and singing them. And one day he's sitting there, and when you, when you sing, a, when you call out to someone, basically what is bhajan? Bhajan is not some mechanical process, you know, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. No, it's a song of the heart. It's a, it's a prayer, actually. It's more of a prayer than a mantra. And we're calling out, my dear Krishna, my dear... Radharani, please pick me up from this ocean of death and fix me as an atom at your lotus feet in the spiritual world. And if you learn to call that in that such a way, if you, if you pray to have some bhakti, some devotion, because bhakti is something that comes by blessings. If you pray like that and you can sing like that, then Krishna will hear. He'll hear. Just like a baby crying in the crib, it's kind of uncomfortable. Mommy doesn't come. But if cobra comes, <laughs> slithers into the crib, baby cries, Mama! <laughs> Mommy comes running. So through our practice of bhakti through the years, if we can purify our hearts of lust and anger and greed, all the bad things that come between us and God, then, and we can chant with just love for Krishna. Maybe a few tears will come to the eyes. Krishna will hear. You remember that song? Knock, knock, knock on heaven's door. That's kirtan. You know? You knock on someone's door long enough. Hello? Krishna. <laughs> so we must spend our life. Kirtan yad sadhari. Kirtan yad sadhari, Mahaprabhu says. Chanting all the time. Prabhupada said, if you've got time, chant Hare Krishna. Because it's a prayer, calling out to your beloved Lord. It's the most important activity in Krishna consciousness. And as devotees advance, they find more and more time for chanting Hare Krishna. So this little boy, apparently because he was fluent in Sanskrit, composing beautiful songs and glorification of Radha and Krishna, Krishna heard him and one day he was sitting on the bank of the river and a beautiful deity of Krishna floated by. This deity was made of black stone, 
from South India. But Krishna is Yogeshwar. He's the master of all mystics. So this deity was floating. And um, very beautiful, bluish black like a monsoon cloud. His lips were smiling in a very beautiful way. His lips were red like bimba fruit. His eyes stretched almost all the way to his ears. Um, his beautiful hands and the poise of playing a flute. Trimanga Sundara bent in three different places. Krishna, the all-attractive supreme personality of Godhead, the goal of all yoga, bhakti, love. So the little boy, when he saw this deity, he took it, oh, I'm calling Krishna, and Krishna's coming. Right? We, we have to think like that. How, no matter how fallen we are, we have to think one day, in the distant future, by the mercy of Guru and Krishna, I'll see Krishna. He took that deity, and he dove in the water, and he came back, and he put the deity standing in his little hut. He didn't have a beautiful temple room like we have here in Chaupati, where the, these deities are worshipped at the highest standard, and they're so beautiful, and they bring forth some emotion from your heart. No, he just had a little hut. But the deity was perfectly satisfied with this service. Offer me with a, a love, Krishna says, a fruit, a leaf, a flower, whether you offer something very simple, it doesn't matter, but if it's offered with some devotion from the heart, it's the devotion that Krishna is attached to, not the object itself. He wants us to love him as we want to love him. So he'd pick some flowers and offer them, and he'd sing for his deity, like that. That was actually his special form of worship, what he'd sing to his deity every day. And in fact, the word spread, and Sanskrit scholars, it's noted in the annals of that time, that Sanskrit scholars were um, amazed that he was singing such songs in difficult Sanskrit, and that the nature of his songs were about not only Krishna, but Radha. Radha is the Ladini Shakti. She's the pleasure potency of the Lord, manifested from the very heart of Krishna. Krishna is the supreme enjoyer, by one definition. Krishna is the supreme enjoyer, and we're in his parts and parcels, and we're meant to enjoy by serving him. He's the master, we're the servant. He's great, we're very small. So he's the supreme enjoyer, but what's enjoyment without enjoying with someone? Enjoyment means, you know, you're with your wife or your husband, or your kids or your neighbors, or your friends or your congregation at the temple. No one thinks of it, you know, once in a while we'll take a little break to be alone. But we really want to enjoy, we want to be with our friends. So this comes from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He's the Supreme Enjoyer. Therefore he expanded his pleasure potency. That person who loves him the most, Shimati, Radharani, she's the girl that you see pictured with Krishna, the divine uh, couple. So, in those days, during the time, you know, 300 years before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Yuga Avatar in this age, who introduced the process of chanting Hare Krishna, in those days, that's like, he, he, had, he was born, Jayadeva Goswami, 300 years before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was born 500 years ago, so we're talking about 800 years ago. The glories of this divine consort of Krishna, she has so much love for Krishna that um, she's in charge of devotional service. And we pray to Radharani, please help me come to your beloved Krishna. Prabhupada said one time that Radharani sees the little efforts of us struggling in this world, trying to come to the stage of controlling our minds and senses and trying to devote a little love. And out of compassion, Radharani says to Krishna, my dear Lord, look down there on the earth planet in Mumbai. There's a young teenage boy and he's coming to the temple out of curiosity. He's beginning to awaken his dormant love for you because everyone's a devotee by Krishna, of Krishna by definition. Like George Harrison said, 
Everyone's a devotee of Krishna, some know it and some don't. <laughs> so when Radharani sees that someone's trying to love Krishna, she says to Krishna, my beloved, please accept that boy or that girl as your very own. And from the heart, Krishna begins to guide us from darkness to light, from ignorance to truth, from the material world to the spiritual world. He's so kind. But 800 years ago, um, the glories of Radharani were not so much known. Um, only much later, during the time of Madhavan Dipuri and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the full glories of Radharani were revealed to the world. It's actually said that only three persons can understand what is Mahabhava. Bhava means love, and Maha means great. So we all want to be lovers, but there's some connoisseurs of love for Krishna. Uh, one is Radharani herself, and one is Madhavindapuri, and one is Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, Madhavindapuri, it's interesting because it's described that he started speaking about Radharani and pure devotional service uh, when, when he appeared a little bit before Lord Chaitanya. And it's described that how he knew or how he was one of those persons who exhibited that highest love that um, in the spiritual world, Madhavindapuri is a, a Kalpa Viksha tree. <laughs> but in the spiritual world, everything's supremely conscious and every one and everything is fully dedicated to loving Krishna. It's not like a tree in this world. Don't think of it in that way. The trees render service to Krishna by giving him shade and giving him fruits and their ecstasy is demonstrated when their sap runs down the trunk <laughs> like that. So Madhavindapuri is categorized as one of the three persons who really knows what is love for Krishna because he stands at the tree, as a tree in Nidivan and that's one of the places Radha Krishna come to perform their loving pastimes. So he's overseeing these pastimes. So he's, he knows what these things are about. So Jayadev Goswami, way before that, he introduced this understanding of Radha Rani, which was later really revealed by Lord Chaitanya. When God comes, he says it all. You know, we can say a little bit of that, but you know, Aham Savasya Pavavo Matta Sarvam Pavartate. He said, Krishna says in Gita, that he's the source of all that is material and all that is spiritual. So he knows everything. So when Lord Chaitanya came, he came to introduce the chanting of Hare Krishna as a simple process for becoming God conscious. But he also explained some of these higher ideas so we could know what is the goal. And he's famous as the person who really revealed. Um, the glories of pure devotional service in the CC Adi 4 um, 55 if, if I'm not mistaken it said the loving affairs of Radha and Krishna are transcendental manifestations of the Lord's internal pleasure giving potency although Radha and Krishna are one in their identity they separated themselves eternally now these two transcendental identities have again united in the form of Lord Chaitanya. I bow down to him who has manifested himself with the sentiment and complexion of beautiful Radha, although he is Krishna himself. So now we know a little bit about Radha and Krishna. They're not just boyfriend and girlfriend standing on the altar. They're the absolute truth and their relationship is one of love. And we all want to love. We all want to love and we want to be loved. Love is the highest pleasure. If you have everything in this world, but you don't have someone to share it with, you can't be happy. And if you have nothing in this world, but you have someone to love and share it with, you can be happy. So that propensity to love is fulfilled on the transcendental platform. Because love in this world, it's here today, it's gone tomorrow. At least at death it's finished. So if we want to really love, we have to become bhakti yogis and learn to love that beautiful couple standing on the, on the altar. So perhaps Jayadeva Goswami's greatest contribution in helping us to understand divine love is that book which Prabhupada mentions and actually elaborates on in the purport. It's called Gita Govinda, where he describes, describes you know, what, what is really deep bhakti. 
um, for Radha and Krishna. However, we're not going to read from that book today because it, it's really meant for highly advanced souls <laughs> or enlightened audience, and not so much for the general public or even neophyte devotees. It's there for us to read when uh, when all the bad things are gone from the heart. No selfishness is there. And um, we're, we're becoming really pure. Then we can hear those things and understand. So Jayadev Goswami, as Prabhupada mentions here in the purport, he lived during the reign of a king in Bengal whose name was Lakshman Sen. And, you know, he, he kept writing. He kept singing. But his magastopam, you could say, was that, that Gita Govinda. But as he grew older, he became famous. People liked their songs, his songs. People like to sing love, love songs, but it's mostly lust songs. <laughs> they call it love, but Prabhupada said, lust means for me and love means for Krishna. So people of that time were much more elevated, much more pure, much more spiritually advanced than we, we are. So they wanted to hear about the Divine Lover and how they could wake in their love for him. So they loved the songs of Jayadev Goswami. So he's there on the bank of the Ganges and he's growing older. And one day the king of that country, Lakshman Sen, he was sitting in his court listening to some music and songs that were being played by the court musicians. In those days, you know, king was big responsibility. And uh, sometimes they got tired or burnt out, so to speak. So the courtiers, they would come and they'd, there'd be a joker, he'd tell some jokes and make the kings laugh. Some girls would dance. And sometimes to soothe him, uh, music and song was played for him. So one day, the musicians, they were playing and singing a song composed by Jayadev Goswami. And the king, after that, he said, wow, that was really nice. Who wrote that? <laughs> and the musicians replied, well, this was composed by a renunciate living outside the city on the bank of a river. His name is Jayadev Goswami. So the king, he wasn't like our modern politicians, you know, some corruption. I won't go into any details here. I pick any most presidents around the world. But anyway, it's another story. No, they were Rajarishis. The leaders of, of, of yore, days of yore, they were Rajarishis. It means they were kings, but they were pure of heart. They were kings, but they were God conscious. They ruled their kingdom with an iron fist, you could say. But spiritually, they encouraged people in the principles of religion. They didn't say what religion you had to follow. Now, there's so many spiritual traditions. You take the one you feel comfortable with and practice it according to your heart, and we'll all meet up there. They encourage universal truths, cleanliness, truthfulness, mercy, austerity, divinity, like that. So that's the kind of king he was. So when he heard the divine songs of Jayadev, he said, you know, I, I want, tell him to come here. So all the ministers laughed. <laughs> he's a renunciate. He's, ha he's satisfied living in a grass hut. He's not like you. He has to be surrounded by all his opulence to be happy. He won't come here. So that king, demonstrating his um, spiritual nature, he very humbly said, I'll go to see him. What does humility come from? Genuine humility means that you feel very small. Um, like when I was a kid, I liked to, I'm from California, United States of America, and we had everything there. We had the beaches on the left, and we had the mountains on the right, we had the desert on the south. So I used to go hiking in the Sierra, Sierra Nevada mountains. And I remember as a, as a boy that I always feel, felt very humbled because the mountains were so great. Like I was a good football player, a great swimmer, yeah. I'd go out in the mountains and I'd become humbled. So the, the true sign of a, a yogi or a rishi or a mystic is his humility, which is 
the result of seeing how great God is. He's actually had darshan with God. Darshan means to see. He's actually, because of his purity, he's actually had darshan with God, so therefore he knows who's the boss. And he's very humble. Sometimes it's hard to find a real yogi. It's hard to find a real rishi, a real saint, because they'll be sitting in the back of the room. Where's Radha Swami right now? He's in the back of the room. Need I say more? <laughs> so he, this king, he, what is that saying? If the mountain won't come to Muhammad, Muhammad goes to the mountain. He um, dressed as an ordinary, well, not an ordinary sadhu, sadhu is not ordinary, but he dressed as a sadhu so the people wouldn't see him. <laughs> And he went to see Jayadev Goswami. And when he arrived, he revealed to Jayadev Goswami who he was, and he asked him, please come to the royal palace and sing for me day and night. I'll maintain you. And Jayadev Goswami said, I'm not being maintained. Nitya nitya nam chaitanas chaitanam eko bahanam yo vadidati kamam. Out of all the eternal created beings, there's one who's maintaining everyone else. And Prabhupada comments that just as the ant gets one grain of sugar every day, he doesn't go to the factory. The elephant gets one ton of hay every day, he doesn't go to the factory. Would not a saint who's renounced the pleasures of this world, the so-called pleasures of this world, to just depend upon God, would he not be maintained by God? Of course. So have no fear. So he said, I don't need to be maintained. <laughs> I'm... I'm living on the river, you know, I live in nature, and you know, so forth and so on. But then the king, he said, you're a renunciate, you're a sadhu, and sadhus are meant to give their association to others. Hmm? So here's what I'll do. Right next, well, near my palace, there's a forest of chumpak trees. You make your little simple bhajan there, and sometimes I'll come and take the dust of your feet. So Jayadev agreed because he was a good Vaishnava. The distinguishing characteristic of a Vaishnava, there's different trans classes of transcendentalists, there's yogis, there's jnanis, and there's bhaktis, is that the Vaishnava, he's not satisfied to go home, back home alone. He wants to take all his brothers and sisters with him. Just like if a house is on fire, you know, you run around and you get your brothers and sisters and you get them out of the house. You don't just jump out. So a saintly person, he sees all living entities equally as brothers and sisters because we have one common father. So we really are brothers and sisters. So before he goes back to the spiritual world, hey, come on, hey, come on, hey, come on. <laughs> I'm making it simple. He, he, he says, you know, take up some spiritual life, do some meditation, do some yoga, become vegetarian, give up racism. You know, he starts trying to help us understand higher morals and introduces transcendental things like Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama. He doesn't want to go home alone. It'll be no fun. The brothers and sisters won't be there. So, Jayadev did that. He moved camp. He went to the Champak forest, and every day the king would come and take the dust from his feet. It said that you can make a quantum leap in your spiritual life by getting the dust of the feet of a pure devotee of Krishna, or the water that's washed his feet, or the remnants from his plate. So the king did that. I don't know what happened to that king. He's probably back to Godhead by now. So later on, uh, Jai Dev Goswami, he moved from there and he, he became a, 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 a poet in the, the court of, a, of the king of Arissa. And he lived in Jagannath Puri. I'm kind of skipping ahead here because we don't have so much time, but just to share with you some more of his glories. Um, and while he was living in Puri, singing and composing, that's all he did, Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Shmarana, singing, chanting, dancing, remembering Krishna. Um, the, in that city of Puri, there was a pure devotee Brahmana who had a very beautiful daughter. And this young lady, she had all saintly qualities. Tatikshava Krunika Shuridam Shavadehinam Achata, Shatava, Shunta, Shadava, Sadabushana. 
Sadhavas, Sadhabhushana means that as you become cleansed, as you become pure through your yoga practices, then all your, your bad qualities melt away and your good qualities manifest. So this girl was beautiful and, and, and saintly from birth. And her name was Padmavati. And when she became old enough to be married, her father, listen to this, her father took her in front of the deity of Krishna, in front of the deity of Lord Jagannath, in the main temple of Puri. He brought his daughter in, in front of the deity, and he said to the Lord, I've brought my daughter to your lotus feet. She's yours. Goodbye. Okay, we're all Krishnas. <laughs> he was really on some higher level, right? Some high level. So he took his daughter, can you imagine? And he put her in front of the deity. I brought my daughter to you, my Lord. She's yours. Goodbye. <laughs> now, it may sound kind of fanatical, but actually the duty of the parents, really, is to deliver their children from the repetition of birth and death and send them home. That's a good mom and dad. They don't just feed you, clothe you. They, they help you advance. They're your original gurus. Your mom and dad are original gurus. So you could say he did the right thing. It's a little extravagant, but, you know, and then he walked out. But the deity, he said to the Brahmana, wait a minute, I have a servant. His name is Jayadev. <laughs> he's given up everything in this life and he's chanting my holy names. Please take the girl and give her to that sadhu in marriage. Now bear in mind, Jayadev had been a brahmachari the whole time. It may sound strange that the deity talks, but if he's the all-conscious supreme personality of Godhead, what's impossible for him? Again, he's Yogeshwara. He's the master of all mystic potencies. One little Brahmin boy, he said to the Lord one time, it's also in the CC, my dear Lord, you're not a statue. You're directly the son of Maharaj Nanda. And this becomes revealed to you as you be advance in spiritual life. Actually, Prabhupada said that at the opening of the LA temple, we were installing little Radhakrishna deities. And Prabhupada said to the, all the young devotees, if you see this deity as brass, he'll remain brass to you forever. But if you serve him according to the rules and regulations and the teachings and the scriptures, he said one day this deity will speak to you. Hare Krishna. Prabhupada Ki. So immediately that Brahmana, he took his daughter to where Jayadev was singing in the temple and explain the whole scenario. You know, the deity said, I'm, you're supposed to marry my daughter. So initially, Jayadev, he was not so inclined. He was Brahmachari. Brahmachari means a celibate monk who is focusing on his studies and um, his mantras and doesn't have so much association with the ladies. He's very respectful to the ladies. But he's not interested in getting married because he wants to dedicate his whole time to um, spiritual life like that. So... Um, but the Brahmin said, you know, this is what God said. So he said to Jayadev the same thing. I brought my daughter to you. She's yours. Goodbye. <laughs> so then he walked out and Jayadev, this renounced, renounced saint, is standing next to this beautiful, gorgeous young girl. Now it said that, it, I don't know if it's actually in the Shastra, but it's one of those traditional sayings that a Brahmachari... Um, he has to obey everything the guru says except to get married. <laughs> I don't know if that's the policy here. And I don't want to get in trouble with the authorities here. But a brahmachari, he has to follow every instruction the guru says except if the guru says get married. You can say, no, sir. <laughs> Thank you. But anyway, that's not for me to say here in Chapati. <laughs> I don't even want to. Sorry, brahmacharis. You just yeah, take it to heart, boys. <laughs> But Jayadev was very polite because as sadhus, he loves everyone. He doesn't see any distinctions, black, white, yellow, man, woman, not even cat, dog, or bird. He sees everyone equal and he loves everyone. One time in London, someone said to Prabhupada, you know, Prabhupada, everyone loves you. And Prabhupada said, yes, that's because I love everyone. 
So he said to her, young lady, tell me where you would like to go because I'm going to take you there and say goodbye. But this was no ordinary girl. She came from a very high cultured family. She was extremely intelligent. But like girls sometimes do in such situations, she started crying. A woman's tear, tear is her ultimate weapon. <laughs> so, but then she said, she composed herself, and she said, Prabhuji, my father has brought me here to marry you on the order of the Lord. So if you do not accept me as your wife, do you think Lord Jagannath will be very happy with that? He ordered it, and you're his devotee. Are you going to disobey him? So that's like, you know, in chess, what do they call that when you, huh? Checkmate. <laughs> Who says women aren't intelligent? <laughs> They're the most intelligent. So he said, okay, all right, you got me. And he took up that responsibility very, very seriously. And together they worked as a team. I mentioned the other day at a marriage ceremony that, um, Prabhupada said, my Guru Maharaj, he created an army of renunciates, but I'm creating ar an army of householders. Boys and girls who work together in a loving spirit and, and that share that infectious love of Krishna with others. Actually, this Hare Krishna movement spread mostly because of the householders. So, he said, if it is the will of the, of the Lord, I accept with full responsibility. So it was just after that that he started writing his Gita Govinda. And one day, in the morning, or in the afternoon, he was writing this very special book, called the Sanam Bhonam of all uh, loving feelings devotees have for Krishna. And he had already named it Gita Govinda. And... Um, his wife was cooking, Pamavati was cooking lunch, and he came to this, this part where he was writing about Radharani's love for Krishna and how Krishna comes under the control of Radharani. He said, wait a minute, God's the supreme controller, so how does he become controlled by somebody else? <laughs> Couldn't figure it out, right? If you go to Webster's Dictionary, the definition is God, the supreme controller. So he's writing about how Radharani's love can bring Krishna under her grasp, her divine love. And he's telling her, how do I, is this, is this possible? That God can become subservient to the love of his devotee? He said, I don't know about that. So, you know if you're a writer, many of you writers, I've, I've written a number of books, sometimes you get that writer's, what's it called? Block. And you just can't figure out what the next sentence is. So he got this writer's block in a transcendental way and he told his wife, um, I'm going to go down and take a bath in the Ganges and then come back and we'll, we'll have lunch. So listen to this. The amazing thing happened. While he was gone, and this gives great joy to the devotees, Krishna disguised himself as Jayadev Goswami, came to the house where Padmavati was cooking, went to where the book was, the palm leaves, and wrote something. He wrote the next verse, which really was the conclusion there, right? Would you like to know what that verse was that he wrote? Shmara Gharla Kundanam Mama Sharashi Mandalanam Dehi Para Palavam Udaram. O Radhe, please ornament my head with the fresh lotus buds of your feet. By doing so, you will satisfy the intense feelings of separation I have for you and satisfy my love for you. Very beautiful verse. If I ever got a tattoo, I don't have any tattoos. <laughs> I'll get that verse in the tattoo. You have it in the back there? Yeah, yeah, the hand. I have one of you. So this, this shows how Krishna, out of love, he becomes subservient to his devotee. And there's this famous picture of Krishna taking the lotus feet of Radha and putting her feet on his head. Such a transcendental mellow. So then Krishna tried to go out quickly, because you know Jayadev was going to come back, and Padmavati stopped him. She said, my dear husband, you're going out again? Because she thought that was her husband. Sit down and take prasadam. 
So Krishna had to sit down and accept the offering. He'd already accepted as the deities in the house of Radha and Madhava. He had to eat it twice. Because you know, you offer your food to Krishna, right? So she'd offered the food. So she thought it was her husband. Sit down. It was Krishna. He ate the same offering twice. I don't think that's ever happened in the history of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Then he got up and left. And, and just a few minutes later, the real Jayadev came back. And he says... Dehi, my, my Devi, I'm hungry. Is Prashadam ready? She, what do you mean? You just ate here and you ran back outside. I just fed you. What do you mean you just fed me? I just came back from the river. So she described the whole scenario, how he came in. and She said, you wrote something down. Now, these type of devotees, they're, you know, they're very uh, sensitive to Krishna consciousness. So thinking... Maybe that was Krishna. So he ran over to where the Lord had wrote that um, statement. Dehi pada palava mudhuram. That how Krishna bows down his head to the lotus feet of Radharani and he fainted. Padmavati, ah, what happened? <laughs> she kind of woke up and he, he started dancing in ecstasy. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. So that's one of the most important sections of the, uh, of the Gita, Govinda. Sometime later in his life, um, he moved to the place which is most dear to all the Vaishnavas, the Gaudiya Vaishnavas, the followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the avatar for the sage. That's called Vrindavan. It literally, Vrindavan, because Krishna had so many pastimes there while he was on this planet, it's imbued with transcendental energy and transcendental ecstasy and all the residents are hopeful for developing love for Krishna. So much so that there's 5,000 temples there. It's a village, but there's 5,000 temples. I travel throughout the Middle East constantly and I go to, for example, I was recently in, uh, in Dubai and the sheikh, the owner of, or the ruler of that area, he wants a uh, a mosque on every temple, every corner of the city. But we've got Vrindavan where there's a temple in every house. <laughs> it's such a special place. And you wander through Vrindavan and you hear this Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, and the Arctic bells and so forth and so on. So it's natural that a devotee would be pulled, like a materialistic person, he's pulled to Disneyland. Right? just has to go to Disneyland. Even if he's 80 years old, he's never been there. <laughs> so devotee has to go to Vrindavan. So he went there and he lived on the banks of the Jumuna River at Keshigat. And every day he would sing his songs, and especially Geet Govinda, and people would come and there and listen to him. But towards the end of his life, he, he moved back to Jagannath Puri, where by that time, that... Uh, collection of poems or songs, Gita Govinda, was the most popular uh, song in Jagannath Puri. Everywhere people were walking and singing like that, right? That's their favorite song. Like in the material, everybody, material whatever, everyone has their favorite song. You know, that's our song, honey. <laughs> but you can't sing it every day, all day, for weeks and months and years, because it's got that material vibration to it. But a song like Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare It's the original love song. O Radha, O Krishna, I've fallen into this material world, this world of birth and death. Just pick me up and take me home and give me some service to you. Let me love you in that world where every step is a dance. Every word is a song. And there's a festival, a flower festival, every day. <laughs> so, yeah. He went to Puri, and he's heard that everyone's singing that song, Gita Govinda, about Vrindavan and Radha and Krishna. And one day, just to make sure, because this was his contribution, great contribution to all the Gaudiya Vaishnavas, he went to see the king of Puri. And he said, Sir, I would like that this Gita Govinda uh, songs be sung for the pleasure of Jagannath, Subhadra, and Baladev every day for eternity. 
So the king, he's also a Rajrishi, he said, sure. Now this was what, remember 800 years ago? If you go to Jagannath Puri today, we can't go in the temple, but you can hear the singing. You will hear every day the Gita Govinda being sung by the Pajaris or the ladies who visit the temple. Persevered over all the ages, despite the invasions in India and you know this and that and the change of the guard and because p this song resonates with the heart. What's the heart? The heart's the abode of love. And even though you don't understand so much, when you chant it, you can get a sense for that. So people keep chanting Gita Govinda and they keep chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Hare. My time's up. I wish I could speak to you for hours and hours, but it looks like we've got enough flowers anyway. <laughs> and your hands are all pink, like. <laughs> so, um, and also Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, um, years later, he also became very attached to hearing that song. He, he, when he was in Jagannath Puri, Mahaprabhu appeared for two reasons, to give the um, simple process of chanting Hare Krishna as a, the way to achieve perfection in this age. But he had an internal reason. He was, you know, Radharani was always, I love you, I love you, I love you. And, you know, he wanted to know how, how deep was her love. But because he was the object of that love, he couldn't understand how, what her love was. So he kind of took that role of Radharani. Radha and Krishna, this is really esoteric, they became one in the personality of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Shri Krishna Chaitanya Radhe Krishna Nahayanga. But Lord Chaitanya, part of his mission was to experience the love of Radha for Krishna. So one way he would do that, his devotees, his personal servants, they would surround him and, and they would sing songs from the Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th Canto, and the songs of Gita Govinda. And this way, Mahaprabhu, now I understand how Radha loves me. So I hope that by today you've heard some of the glories of Jai Dev Goswami, that you will remember him throughout the day. Remembering the devotees, as good as remembering the Lord, because they're always united in love, again. So I hope you remember, actually there's a statement in the Nectar of Devotion, which is a book of love that our guru also wrote, and it's there it's stated that to um, not observe the uh, appearance or disappearance of, a, of the Lord or his devotees or any other significant festivals mentioned in that book, that's an offense. So we're very fortunate today we're coming together in a festive mood to honor the beloved deities of Radha and Krishna here with a flower festival. And we can also remember the devotee Jayadev Goswami and properly observe. It's very nice that, this, that it falls in the disappearance day of Jayadev Goswami. So let us constantly remember and glorify the devotees. As Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said, we want to love God. We want to love Krishna. We want to fulfill that propensity of our heart. That love is greater than anything this world has to offer. Otherwise, why would saints renounce everything and just try to love God if there wasn't some higher pleasure in that? You can only give up something if you get something better. So it must be true. It must be, must be real. So let us remember these persons who guide us on that path. Our search should not be so much for God, but for devotee, a saint who can take us to God. Just like you may want to meet, you come to India, well, I'd really like to meet the Prime Minister Modi. Good luck. You can meet Mr. Modi. But if you know a friend of Mr. Modi, or you know a relative of Mr. Modi, come on. <laughs> He'll take you there. So that's a little secret we're revealing to you. If you want to understand the absolute truth, the supreme, the divine, Krishna, as he's described, Tribunga Sundara with a Vajayanti garland waving in the, to, to his feet and his bimba red-colored lips. If you want to see that supreme Lord and interloving relationship, then you have to uh, have the association of devotees. So maybe today we'll make a little advancement because there's so many of us together. If you go to the city hall and you say, hey, Mr. Mayor, you know what? <laughs> but if you go with a big crowd of people, hey, then he opens the window, what? So better than sitting home and chanting today, we all come together 
And the way that Krishna really likes to hear us, because, you know, you like to hear your name sung, so God likes to hear his name sung, we all come together and very loudly we chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. And we worship the devotees as much as we worship the Lord. A devotee is freed from fault finding. A devotee doesn't criticize. If there's something wrong, he tolerates. He knows the chanting will purify it. Just as he loves God, he loves the devotees. All the devotees, past, present, and future. There's a wonderful uh, verse um, composed by a great devotee who lived many years ago. Fortunately, so many great devotees lived before us, so we can get the nectar of their instructions. His name was Devaki Nandana, and this is one of my favorite verses. He's glorifying the devotees. Listen up. Be all ears. Shakala Vaishnava Pade Mora Namaskara Iti Kichu Aparada Nahuk Amara Hoyachan Hoyben Prabhur Jato Bhakta Vrinda Bandana Kori Shabara Chara Naravinda. And I quote I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of all Vaishnavas praying I will not commit offenses in my attempts to please them. To all Vaishnavas who have ever been, and to all Vaishnavas who will ever be, I offer my obeisances to the lotus feet. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> I'd like to conclude, it's stated in Vedic scriptures that at the conclusion of an auspicious event there should be some high point. Like in, in the, when you're eating, right? At the end, you eat the sweets. <laughs> so it's very sweet. Madhur, madhur, madhur bhaje. To conclude with something relishable. So just after he wrote the Gita Govinda, this great devotee Jayadeh Goswami, he penned the following verse, you could say, about that book to attract those who are elevated to understand it, to read it. And I, I really love it. And he wrote, and this is really a nice way to finish the program today, or the verse, or the class. He said, whatever is delightful in the varieties of music, whatever is graceful in fine strains of poetry, and whatever is exquisite in the sweet art of love, let the happy and wise persons Learn from, learn that from the songs of Gita Govinda. Wow. My third tattoo. <laughs> I'll read it one more time. This is like the final blessings we're getting from Jayadeva Goswami, encouraging us to love Krishna, to love Radha and Krishna, through reading books of transcendental nature. Whatever is delightful in the varieties of music. Why don't you repeat? Whatever is delightful in the varieties of Whatever is graceful and finds strains of poetry. And whatever is exquisite in the sweet art of love. Let the happy and wise persons learn that from the songs of Gita Govinda. Shri Gita Govinda ki. Shri Jayadev Goswami ki. Shri Madhavinda Puri ki, Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu ki, Vrindavaneshwari Shri Mata Radharani ki, Shri Prabhupada ki, Shri Bhajibhumi Shri Vrindavan Dhamma ki, Shri Sri Radha Krishna ki, all the assembled devotees ki, the flower festival ki, JJ Sri Radhe. Sham, thank you very much. See you tonight. Hare Krishna. <laughs>